Good evening. On behalf of the Alladi Memorial Trust and the Center for Human Rights, University of Hyderabad, I welcome you all to this, the Alladi Memorial Lecture 2023, which is being held in 2024. I request uh, Professor Jyotirmaya Sharma, Dean School of Social Sciences, to chair this lecture. I request Professor G.N. Devi to occupy uh, his position on the days. I now hand over the proceedings uh, of this evening to Professor Sharma. Yeah. May I request uh, Satyaki to hand over uh, a bouquet to Professor Sharma. Uh, Prof um, Mr. Satyaki will hand over one to uh, Professor Devi. May I now uh, request Professor uh, Jyotirmay Sharma to conduct the proceedings. Professor G. N. Devi, Professor Alladi Uma, Professor M. Sridhar, students, colleagues, friends, Ladies and gentlemen, I extend a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the School of Social Sciences. The School of Social Sciences is celebrating the golden jubilee of its inception this year, i.e. 2024. The school has contributed immeasurably to the credibility, visibility and relevance of this university. And it has done so by standing for truth, civility, decency, and the primacy of intellectual endeavor. In this journey, it is the students and teachers who have made the School of Social Sciences their home that have also shaped and nurtured these values over the years. The School of Social Sciences consists of five departments and eight centers. The faculty strength at the moment is 70 faculty members. With the student strength being 934, uh, we are the largest school in the university. And on behalf of all the students and faculty members, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I, I want to start uh, with, a, with a small quote from a text. The quote goes as follows, and I quote, Then one time, when I was in the seventh decade of my life, a strange virus swooped down upon humans. They decided to lock down life, with everybody asked to stay inside their dwellings. Universities, schools, offices, factories, farms, streets, wards, parties, theatres and public halls all were kept under lock and key. The sun and the moon became distant. Only TV and digital screens were kept alive by talking about the virus and spreading other viruses. Being on my own, I thought I would open the book of my memory and pen a portrait of a poem that has been speaking to the nation for two millennia. I have done it in the hope that the future world is free of all viruses, tangible and abstract. My mind is at peace with the future." End quote. This is from the preface to a book called the Mahabharata, the epic and the nation written by Professor G.N. Devi, our speaker this evening. Uh, a thinker, a cultural activist, and an institution builder. Professor Devi uh, obtained his MA and his PhD from Shivaji University, Kolhapur, and another additional MA from the University of Leeds. 
Uh, he is currently Professor of Eminence and Director School of Civilization at Somaya Vidya Vihar University. He earlier taught at the Maharaja Sahajira University of Baroda. He writes in three languages, Gujarati, Marathi and English. He's written over a hundred books on literary criticism, literary history, philosophy, education, anthropology and linguistics. He says that most of his life has been spent in the dogged pursuit of suppressed knowledge that lies beyond or unregistered by the elite confines of academia, specifically in documenting and preserving and giving voice to marginalized and suppressed languages and knowledge systems in the communities and civilizations that made, made them and used them. To this end, he initiated and founded the Bhasha Research Publication Center, and the Denotified Nomadic Tribes Rights Action Group, and the Adivasi Academy. He also conducted uh, this most ambitious and mammoth project uh, called the People's Linguistic Survey of India. Um, the Alladi lecture this evening will be based on his recent co-edited book, The Indians, Histories of a Civilization, uh, where he also talks about the role of language in making, in the making of these histories. I uh, want you to join me in extending a very, very warm welcome to Professor Devi. Uh, <laughs> Professor Devi will garland the portrait of Dr. Ladi Krishnaswamy uh, before uh, he gives his lecture. I feel very touched that I have this opportunity of garlanding the image of a man who's part of deciding the destiny of this nation in the Constituent Assembly. And the Constitution began with the words, we the people. Now, I want all those who are standing there to join me on the stage when I garland this image. I invite all of you to come to the, please. Then I'll garland the image. Please. Because, because garlanding this image is garlanding the constitution of India. Do you believe in the constitution of India or not? Come, join me. Please. All of you, those who are standing, please do come. Please, please. I say please for the last time now. Come, come to the stage. Come quickly. Come. It's an extraordinary honor for me. And uh, I cannot thank you, Umaji, enough for being so patient with me. Uh, I turn out to be a difficult guest, uh, not, uh, not because I am difficult, but the circumstances beyond my, you know, uh, Dr. Jairat's daughter called me to Guwahati and then I had to go there, so I mean, you, between you, you have to settle that, and I miss. I cannot say how honored I feel being here. Thank you so much. And uh, all, the, all the distinguished students and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm really, really delighted to be speaking to you this evening. Thank you for giving this space to me. Uh, Chairman, sir, please tell me when I need to stop. Yeah. William Blake, talking of an extraordinary, intense experience of his connect with the rest of the, you know, the history of spirituality and history of rebellions, uh, wrote that little poem, which many of us think is a funny poem 
Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand do I create? Well, no, thy fearful symmetry. I often think of the state of mind that every member of the constituent assembly had when the assembly decided to define, describe, and create India. What would be the image of, I mean, like Blake says about the tiger, who, you know, who created this fearful cement, they would be asking, well, what is India? We, the people, hereby swear that, you know, we give to ourselves this constitution of India that is Bharat, but what is India that is Bharat? And of course, we heard so often very rhetorical answers to that, that is not it's not just land, but it's a dream. It's not just, you know, it's not people, but rivers and mountains. I mean, moving passages we heard, poetic passages we heard. But what indeed it is? That's a question. Now, if I were to ask this to a seven-year or nine-year-old, they would say, well, this map of land is India. But that map has changed so, so often in the past. I mean, no 75 years have passed in this subcontinent without uh, showing us the map of that place change. So which of those maps is our India? In European nations, there is you know, a nation, nationalism, nationality, race, language, religion. We have so much of it. So many religions, so many languages, so many kinds of people. What is that India? When I think of this, <coughs> I tend to satisfy myself by saying that India is a civilization. Now, uh, for a while, that answer satisfied me. But when I started looking at the meaning of the term civilization and how it surfaced, uh, my, uh, my uh, you know, trouble started all over again. Because it was during the, uh, towards the end of the 18th century that Europeans started using the term civilization. For instance, Sir William, you know, uh, working from the Asiatic society, talking about ancient people who seem to surprise the moderns by the civil engineering feat of having created cities. They said it's civilization. So it is Egyptian civilization, Mesopotamia, Indus civilization, and so on. Of course, this was Europe at the end of the 18th century, which was seriously troubled by the question of how to cope with the urban space which was being created there, which was getting born there. Villages had been displaced because of uh, uh, taxation laws. And they, they had to move to places where they thought they would find work. And so where they came got formed as cities, Manchester, Birmingham, London, and in England, so in Germany, so in France, and so on. So in that urban mess of the 18th, early 19th century, they looked back towards the past and said, ah, but those people made such lovely houses, very uh, disciplined gutters and drainages and water distribution and so on. And no armies had to keep security and safety and so on. So civilization was, in that sense, a modern invention or reinvention of the past. But then there was also another meaning attached to that term in Latin which meant strictly speaking nagar, urban city, civic and therefore related to anything related to the cities. But the way I was thinking of civilization was different. I was looking at the founding values of those cities. And so I, was, I, I, I started thinking as to what are the founding values of India that is made by the constitution as India. And when I thought of one value, I always found something contrary, equally powerful, equally alive, equally kicking. 
and there could be no conclusion as to what are the founding values of india from time to time such are promoted articulated but every time they are articulated one finds that the country also exists vasudeva kutumbakam yes but the buddhists were hounded out and the jains were silence therefore i thought it is necessary to look at this question slightly differently and so i decided to look at the idea of india in terms of its language environment its language history its language acquisition and succession initially i was very hesitant doing this but when i spread out the map of the world and figured out where major civilizations had come up in latin america four places in africa four or five in asia about six or seven one related to arabic language family turkic family there's a scene of you know there's uh, of course the ox or the the uh, central asian family and so on dravidic and uh, indic family and i thought that this argument may have some merit so i'm going to exercise that argument place it before you for your consideration i am not trying to persuade anybody uh, when i say what i want to say in the next 25 30 minutes if i were to think of the indian space the subcontinent or whatever was india uh, when homo sapiens were still in africa and had not moved out of africa had only started slowly moving uh, what we call a migration but it's not migration as mass migration or very rapid migration but at at that time there were no languages in india but the homo sapien that moved out of africa carried with him or it language it is language acquisition that made that movement possible out of africa because language got weaponized it provided defense for groups that wanted to move defense protection they were given by language and so they arrived here uh, you have ccmb uh, here in hyderabad and uh, david rick and uh, tangraj is here dr tangraj you heard from them how people settled in prehistory maybe 45000 years ago in south maybe a little later in himalayas north india everywhere they would have made groups small groups what anthropology will call a population knot that is enough number of people to sustain their togetherness but not larger number because that became burden so the larger number moved ahead in the process the language all languages they had brought because this took thousands of years that migration i am talking up about 20000 years time span a 65000 before before us to 45000 years in those 20000 years uh, many many small languages would have emerged here we don't know their names and therefore we do not think that they existed but we know from all other scientific evidence that humans spoke that homo sapiens uh, the homo sapien was a linguistic animal and therefore uh, there is no doubt that such languages would have been there this continued till i mean they went they passed through many phases cold climate exchange with hot and uh, after the last glacial the holocene began the temperature started rising conditions became more favorable for life suddenly the you know grass blades would have sprung up the trunamul would have come up and then the grass and the plants and the trees brought bringing birds and birds bringing animals and animals bringing 
homo sapiens uh, the, uh, who had moved into those caves say bhimbet ka some of you have seen in madhya pradesh but rock shelters they would they had come out and they started wandering about settling uh, settling around as hunters gatherers and slowly later uh, as pastoralis nomads finally about 7000 years before our time approximately moving on to agriculture which came from iran to us at that stage many friends have said why are you bringing agriculture from iran to india was india not sufficiently intelligent and developed the answer is agriculture arrived later where there was less food shortage so we reason to thank our ancestors that they got agriculture later than the iranians got it was food shortage which compelled people to get from hunting gathering and pastoral nomadic habits into agriculture because agriculture is a laborious work this continued till about say 2500 years before christ that's when comes our uh, indus civilization did the sanskrit language exist at that time in india the answer is it did not because it did not exist it had to be in existence in order to be in india it wasn't around it came it came to us it got developed in eurasian steps and it moved one way to iran making you know creating indo iranian and then another way to indo what is unfortunately called indo aryan uh, i will not comment on that term arya just now for paucity of time <clears throat> but there is a lot that could be said to show why that term is wrong itself but the indo the, the earliest indic indo aryan that touches india when i say india don't think of the map of my and your india this is afghanistan afghanistan uh it touches uh, th- that point around 1500 before christ and that brings in the first composition veda rugveda i am saying that prior to that point in time prior to the arrival of sanskrit to what we think is india there were other languages and life was different and life was considerably different in one particular aspect and that is there were no oral traditions of music at that time there is no evidence of that they may be there they may have been there but we don't know enough about it it is when the when this new language arrived were the people not in existence beyond afghanistan and what is pakistan now they were there in they were there in the south in our part where we are and they had a different language call it proto dravidian we don't know what exactly proto dravidian is but that is a matter of research one day we will get to know and even on the eastern side of what is india today say uh, i am talking of 1400 prior to christ think of 700 prior to christ christian era you have a thinker of the magnitude of i mean order of mahavir jain and gautam buddha highly philosophical concepts cannot be developed evolved uh, if it's a brand new language it takes centuries of tradition i mean just to take a simple example when mahavir says aparigraha a, a value foundational value which uh, deeply impacted mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi's entire understanding of violence was based on the idea of uh, greed i mean greed uh, leads to violence that was uh, gandhi never said anger creates violence gandhi always said that greed creates violence non greed aparigraha is a value is is concept that came down all the way from mahavir which gandhi imbibed accepted i am saying that to create such a concept a parigraha you need 
a social situation where parigraha that is accumulation is a practice not to hold becomes a a kind of a positive action one has to one has to promote it so it 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 presupposes a whole context social context and obviously linguistic linguistic uh, tradition i am saying that when sanskrit comes into this uh, subcontinent there is a proto dravidic there are prakruts that is non sanskrit languages because if there were no languages what languages did the farmer speak i said agriculture touches this 7000 this area 7000 years before our time is well spread by 5000 years before our time did the farmers not use any spe- did they not name the plants and seeds all agriculture terminology in this country is in mostly non sanskritic non persian and non non english if one were to do a dictionary of agrarian terms one will find the roots of those other languages in short there was a language uh, continent a new language comes and a language mix starts oral tradition of music and poetry gets settled here this continues for a seven for about 1000 years from 700 for 1400 before christ till about 400 years before christ and that's the time when panini comes around with panini everything changes because that's also the time when script enters this subcontinent there wasn't a script in existence prior to that in for us here it was there for uh, let's say the akkadians the mesopotamians but it wasn't used in this subcontinent with coming of this coming in of the script our society changes all together from the oral tradition of the vedas upanishads you know brahmanas aranyakas and the jain and the you know buddhist uh, oral form teachings you know that uh, the teachings of buddha and mahavir remained unwritten almost for 3 centuries not because those were not worth writing but because a new change was round the corner it came with the inscriptions of ashoka with the grammar of panini script st- became an additional oral tradition is an additional linguistic weapon script is yet another additional linguistic weapon device instrument or what and once this one script has come into india with this language mix you notice you no know, the inscriptions of ashoka in tamil nadu would be in one language in gujarat they would be in another language in bihar they would be in third language so this shows a new relationship of society there is also a new kind of fear which enters which uh, which initiates and consolidates the caste and the varna apparatus that continues for another 1000 years from 4th century before christ till about the 7th century after christ and then the decline of sanskrit language starts prakruts which were suppressed for the previous 2000 years start resurfacing so you have paishachik you had maharashtri prakrut you have a bengali prakrut and so on and a, and and a new tussle between languages begins once again it is at that stage that the nature of the empires kingdoms changes in india it is at that stage that the idea of god or ideas of god that were established till then start getting challenge and new sects emerge sects compete with the caste structure from about 7th century on 7th century ad onward resulting into around the 11th century resulting into a great social movement called bhakti movement and this bhakti movement was a movement that questioned the established ideas of god dragging the you know divine back to the human sphere humanizing god because god became like sakhi sakha dost 
uh, even sometimes uh, enemy to fight with uh, saints our saint poets could sometimes put, put very harsh questions to gods uh, blame them almost like arguing in the court the, the saint poets argued with gods a different india emerges so from the pre sanskrit till early sanskrit from early sanskrit to this written sanskrit prakrut mix to a new india of the desi bhashas starts emerging the state structure undergoes a change students of history will know precisely how the taxation pattern change land holding change state structure change and so on architecture change costume change so many things change the way the cities and the villages balance change in the bhakti period india starts getting defined differently once again and so uh, we have a common thread running across i mean if you look at from basveshwar in karnataka to gnaneshwar and tukaram in maharashtra or meera in uh, central india gujarat rajasthan uh, to jaydeva in bengal or orissa wherever he belong uh, to assam uh, shankar dev uh, tyagaraj here i mean it's a long story extremely complex story not sufficiently well attended by historians and sociologists uh, nobody is explained why that rebellion came up how it got resolved all that we done because we are such you know very uh, pious people we thought that this was only the time of the saints but the rise of the saints and the difficult political sociological philosophical questions been they are still remain unanswered but one thing is it was a different india it was not a fragmented india it was not a india you know the like uh, some people say tukde tukde so the, the saints saint poets of india were not a tukde tukde gang they were unifying india by defining every local every desha differently in fact the uh, i am sure that the makers of the constitution thought of the idea of the republic on the model of the bhakti bhakti that these are different states different languages are emerging different identities emerging and yet there is something common the questions that were raised in these times were common questions i think that's the idea of the republic this change once again with the arrival of the the, the british uh, we had the persian language and the arabic language in impacting us they were accepted sufi tradition emerged here with the coming of the english once again the destiny of indian languages and the destinies of indian people started uh, moving to a different into a different direction uh, you are all very familiar with that history therefore i'll not say even a word more let me just come straight to the time when india became independent 30 years before the independence came our leaders were thinking as to what what would that india be like and so say in the mid 20s 1920s the congress sessions brought up the question of how many languages india will have and they accepted the principle that it will be a multilingual nation now this was not an easy resolution easy easy decision because the inspiration for national independence was received had come during the 19th century from the italian example from the german example from the irish example the sinn fein movement in ireland the unification of germany movement the you know unification of italy movement and italy germany they had decided to become nations of a single language therefore for us to say that we want to be we want to get into this freedom movement like italy did like ireland did at one time we we are getting into this freedom movement but consciously saying that we want to get into it with you know insisting on having a nation of many languages was a remarkable departure 
from the idea of nationalism that Europe had produced. And it was a very fortunate departure, I should say, because the nations, European nations that insisted on single monolingual nationalism during the 19th century ended up in the 20th century, Germany and Italy as fascist nations. Those who had desisted from that kind of nationalism had to fight these countries to keep the world safe. I am very glad that I mean, we have to be grateful to our you know, founding uh, fathers of this country that they thought of having a multilingual nation. And so in 1927, Congress Resolution 26 or 27 that India will have many languages was later then uh, you know moved into the constant assembly uh, every meeting of the constant assembly had discussion on language question except the first meeting that is the inaugural meeting to welcome the members and uh, we know that in the constitution all the debates that were finally resolved became articles the debates which remained unresolved became schedules we have a schedule of languages the eighth schedule the language debate did not get finally resolved so it was a, you know a small committee uh, with Hansa Mehta and others that actually decided that we will have eight schedule with 14 languages now that eight schedule has 22 languages by the way schedule languages does not mean languages of scheduled castes or scheduled tribes many students think that that is not the case it wasn't just a tokenism in the constitution that India accepted to be a multilingual nation, India actually created states for those languages, the state linguistic state reorganization through the 1950s till 1965 actually created states for languages. This was the idea of India, idea of a single India. The idea of single India is always the idea of one India with many tongues, many languages. Linguistic diversity is accepted by us as the foundational value of our republic because it has been a foundational value of our civilization. There is no other way to describe India as meaningfully as one can do by you know using uh, language as a parameter every time india change it is because lang a new language has come in every time india is united it is because languages have decided to come together merge with each other form confluences i must now <coughs> say something slightly depressing since independence, the Indian language diversity has been severely under attack. In 1961 census, the list of mother tongues was uh, had uh, 1,652 names. In 1971 census, the list of mother tongues given by the same census, same mistake, same errors, and no problem because census has a method faulty or right but it's uniformly so uh, this time of course the census has gone on a sabbatical so we don't know what it is uh, 1971 census this figure had come down to 109 1652 to 109 109th name was 108 were names of mother tongues the 109th name said all others all others. Unko bitha diya alag. The names were wiped out. It's a serious situation. As against 1961 census, if you look at 2011 census, you find that the name number has gone to 1369. That means from 1652 to 1369, 280 mother tongues have died. When a language dies in India, India dies, that much of India dies, because this has been the foundation of our civilization. The languages which died were spoken mostly by coastal people, 
ट्राइबल पीपल और डी नोटिफाइड एंड नोमेडिक पीपल दैट इज वॉट इज डाइंग इन द इंडियन रिपब्लिक इज द मार्जिन द मार्जिन पीपल हु केम लॉन्ग टाइम बैक टू दिस प्लेस फॉर्म दोज लिटिल क्लैंस और वॉट यू नो एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट कॉल पॉपुलेशन नॉट्स दोज नॉट्स आर बींग डिस्ट्रॉयड will indian languages stay alive for a very long time the answer is in the face of the new technologies cyberspace uh, continuous surveillance the possibility is very uh, distant perhaps we might lose all of these languages anyway i'll conclude by saying this that if we are to think of india as a continuity it is best spoken in terms of language assimilation continuities if we are to think of india in terms of diversity it is best to think of india in terms of language diversity india is india because india speaks the day india is silenced there is no speech in india there is no india diversity and expression they i should uh, i i don't think i'll be wrong if i say the average per head knowledge of songs anywhere in the world how many songs does a person know indians will come at number 1 they may not be the third or fifth trillion or you know billion or zillion economy it is india is the nation of songs india is the nation of stories india is nation of memory in language oral tradition i think it is our civilization and when the makers of the constitution conceptualized india that way they knew that the people of india will take care of this heritage that the people of india will keep possibilities for the future generations to speak to sing to think in terms of diversity and not be silenced not be muted not be only clapping or only burning the ears thank you uh thank you for this uh, extremely thoughtful and uh provocative i'm not going to say thought provoking which means nothing provocative provocative lecture uh which hopefully will lead to thinking and speech now it's convention usually that in a memorial lecture there are no questions and answers but uh, it's also the tradition of the alladi memorial trust and their lectures that they welcome uh, questions and answers so would you mind an- answering a few questions um uh, since given the uh, the talk itself i'm sure there are a lot of questions we'll have to ration the questions so i'm going to artificially divide uh, the hall into this side and that side and my side um, so 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 uh, arbitrarily i'll start with this side and then go to that side and uh, uh, bunch questions together a few questions together if uh, that's okay <laughs> okay uh we'll uh, start with any question here questions rajat thank you for that excellent lecture sir uh i wanted to ask under what conditions does a language manage to survive given the kind of conditions you just described
See, languages that seek to impose themselves on others die. Sanskrit declined. It's almost dead. Now there is attempt to resurrect it. Latin disappeared. Uh, Persian at one time was the national language, language spoken all over the country. But now it is not spoken all over the country. But the Prakruts, the dialects, they became major languages. They became Bangla, Oriya, Kannada, Telugu, Marathi, Gujarati and so on. Because a language survives only if livelihood possibilities exist in that language. If Latin does not offer any livelihood possibility for you, you will not speak Latin. Only getting certificates of no, your Pandit or Praveen or whatever, you might get a roti. Languages that allow livelihood in those languages survive. I will tell you some tragic cases. These coastal people, I said coastal languages are disappearing because the entire coastal line, entire coastal area of India has been handed over to large companies. The sea belongs to them now. And small fishing people had to disappear from, they had to go inland. Those who were making nets, they had to go inland. Those who were helping making small boats, they, they are all scattered. And therefore those languages are disappeared. In Gujarat there used to be a language called Kharwa. And I have seen with my eyes, nearly four to five young people came together, girls and boys. They had to stay together for one week to choose their life partners. I seen those camps 40 years back. But today there are no Kharwas left in Gujarat. Nobody speaks that language. It has gone. Livelihood possibility. In our country, if we are to keep these languages alive, then our economic planning will have to take language reality into consideration as one of the parameters. Only teaching languages in schools does not help languages. Give roti to the people who speak those languages. They will keep the languages alive. In dino hum sab angrezi bolte hai na. Or nokri ke liye bolte hai. Aur koi nahi. Pyaar ke vaste nahi bolte hai. Thank you. Um, I'll come to hands here. But this side, any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for the lecture. Uh, as you said, that a language survives when it does not try to impose itself. So, by that analogy, as in my part of the country, uh, Hindi is trying to impose itself over the dialects. So, will it also perish? Which is which is your part of the country? I come from Bihar. Bihar. See. Uh, our census is a wonderful exercise. First they ask everybody, they go from door to door, which language do you speak? The names we give are listed as mother tongue names, not as language names. Then this census people sit down, uh, take all those names and filter them and keep only some names alive and they are called language names. Now, under every language name, they show so many mother tongue names. If you look at the Hindi statistics, you will notice that in 2011, the Hindi header heading had 64 other names, one of which was Bhojpuri. 5 crore 3 lakh people have claimed Bhojpuri as their mother tongue, but it's 5 crore shown as Hindi. Bhojpuri is the world's largest growing language by the way. Largest, f fastest growing language, not largest, fastest growing. The, there are uh, languages spoken in Chhattisgarh, all of them and in Rajasthan, Rajasthan has 42 languages, all of them sh are shown as Hindi. All the languages of Bihar are shown as except Magahi and you know maybe one or two, Bajika and uh, uh, Hindi. All Himachal Pradesh languages are shown as Hindi. 
people there are saying you know we speak kumauni gadwali there are 16 languages in himachal pradesh they uh, they uh, uttarakhand they are shown in uh, himachal pradesh languages all are shown as hindis the result is if you remove the, all those languages the figures of hindi will go down from 52 crores now which is 2011 census to about 38 crores that means 14 crores are borrowed hindi speakers but the government thinks it is obligatory to show that hindi is growing because you know in the parliament of india you know uh, upper uh, the lok sabha house the number of uh, you know persons enter from that area is pretty large so um, somebody has to say that the emperor has no clothes <laughs> some day there is there is uh, there is some anger among the hindi speakers about this practice many of my friends who speak hindi tell me that actually the government should give employment to produce employment for people then they will more people will speak hindi rather than concealing the facts reducing the you know language limits give employment but the government is not thinking of employment false pride and uh, untruth are two reasons why languages collapse and hindi is suffering from both i am not saying hindi will collapse but it is spoken by very large numbers but it will not grow the way it should be growing by the way if you are telugu speakers are there any telugu speakers in hyderabad i don't know there used to be at one time yes your reason to worry i'll tell you why if you look at the census figures from 1961 till 2001 it used to be hindi in terms of numbers hindi bangla telugu and marathi in 2011 it is hindi bangla marathi and telugu your telugu is going somewhere yes i mean the, the, the yeah the, the hindi hindi is showing growth of large numbers and telugu is showing decline and that's not a, that's not good for the republic of india if tamil shrinks telugu shrinks kannada shrinks and hindi grows it's not good for india is good i mean i i love the hindi language by the way because all the love songs i sung were hindi love songs <laughs> really i mean they made life beautiful but uh, but uh, hindi needs uh, truth and livelihood truth and livelihood satya or upajivika that will keep hindi growing my side yes you have a question no 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 uh, there is a mic here good evening sir uh, carrying forward that question on dialects uh, since some languages you say are now facing their death uh, most of them are also dialects of a standardized language now talking about the region i come from i come from karnataka there are five sub dialects against the standardized one that is used by the government for their purposes so how do you explain the framework for uh, the survival of these dialects and also for the practicality of communication in the beginning there was language people spoke then came empires and the rulers of the empire spoke that became language and all the just continue to be dialects uh, dialect in language is a reflection of the technology we use for language perpetuation I mean, if it is uh, writing, then non-written languages, non-scripted languages tend to become dialects. I am sure each one of you in your homes have some beautiful objects. We call them craft. 
we don't call them art so what is craft to art dialect is to language actually it is art it is language and by the way uh, every language need not i mean every big language does not have a script the english language does not have a script even till today its own script it is roman script roman script uh, hindi does not have a script of its own it is using nagari script kannada has its script telugu has its script tamil has its script but many other language languages in india use nagari script a common script in rajasthan in maharashtra in hindi and with some modification in gujarat script does not make a language a language and you know power makes a language a language. power makes a dialect a language in karnatak tulu was the language of rulers at one time tulu script was used for kannada or kannada but now the power has shifted and so kannada script is used tulu people have to learn that script as far as tribals are concerned their fate in this country is a big question we need to debate uh, we have either every indian is either born caste or tribe and actually we should feel very proud of the tribes because they are not caste but we never looked at them that way i mean they remain free anyway okay i'm going to just go for one question from here one question from there and one from there and then we'll end this these proceedings gentlemen there um sir as far as my knowledge of history goes languages come and go like we certainly do not speak language of our cave dwelling ancestors political situation change social situation cultural situations change and languages come and go even scripts come and go brahmini was uh, brahmi was once uh, spoken uh, written now it is not is devnagari so from this point of view if some languages are dying and some languages are increasing is it really a point of uh, worry means is it not just a natural process or is it kind of a conspiracy by some group of people especially hindi which is being uh, highlighted here to like dominate other languages and erase them from the india no it is not conspiracy by hindi speakers <laughs> no that is no also sir just one no, no, more no, one no 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 you ask the question and, no, yeah. no no let him reply let him reply then you ask come again okay patience uh, languages uh, are born they grow and they die however one has to remember that languages do not take birth grow and die like buffaloes do i like they are no no in this no i mean they are not organic systems they are cultural systems they are social systems so when we may, when we use the term language is born uh, it is not uh, an organic event it's social event uh, and uh, a language represents a people's world view so when a language disappears the entire world view goes now what is a world view the way people look at space and time and uh, if we lose those world views then the our diversity of appreciating what is out there gets diminished to that extent therefore uh, allowing language to go is not good but natural decline of a language is a phenomenon the world has experienced so many times but if there is a systemic now uh, i don't mind if those 652 mother tongues decline naturally but in 71 the government decided to introduce a cut off point the government said if a language is spoken by more than 10000 persons we will count it if it is not spoken by more than 10000 we have no responsibility towards counting it now this is a non linguistic interference in the life of that language that is uh... yes thank you uh, somebody from here yeah uh, professor basu one minute one minute the mic's coming to you 
do you put a difference between a language surviving and a language spreading? The two are related or would you consider them totally different? They're related, but they're more intimately related in our times than relatively uh, in previous times. Uh, because when we, I mean, let's take a relatively shorter time of time since India became independent, manageable time, I'm saying. Uh, the people were uh, not moving out so easily. But now people migrate from one place to another. And so in that sense, language spread happens. But spread language spread does not guarantee language survival. In Delhi, more than 300 languages are spoken today. If you count each and every language. In Bombay, it's not Marathi or Hindi or Gujarati and Sindhi alone or Urdu, not five or six. Hundreds of languages are being spoken. But not all of those hundreds of languages will survive because their, their own location, uh, at their own location, they're getting weaker. That is, so language spread and language, language geographic spread and language survival are, are less related than they were, say, 70 years ago. That is what I feel. Okay. Any questions here? Your side. Okay. Sir, since you are pointing out the civilizational values, um, so with the coming of uh, Indo-Iranian languages, especially Sanskrit, the new civilizational values are being spread in India, especially the, the Varna, Varna Ashtamba Dharma and Varna system. So, when we take up the uh, theories regarding whether this, uh, these Indo-Aryans, whether natives are their uh, aboriginal homeland, so can you find these values in their homeland also? The Varna system, whether that language has brought it, or caste system, whether Sanskrit has brought it? The answer is no. The answer is, I am not saying that the Sanskrit language does not speak of caste or Varna. It, it does. The answer is, Varna and caste are social products, features of a society. Our society came to that stage. I will not use the term develop, but I will, I mean, but it had shaped to that stage at the time when the Sanskrit language arrived. Say, mm, the English language arrived here, but, uh, but does the English language bring ideas of slavery? Let's say yes, because they colonize us. Does the English language bring ideas of independence? We we'll have to say yes, because that's when the independence struggle. So those ideas, social ideas, are not a gift of a language. The same language, a, a, a given language in one country may exist in another country with dra dramatically different social conditions. So let's not blame language for that. But uh, I will ask you, the Egyptian civilization had a phenomenon called the pharaohs or the pharaohs. I mean, those were the guys who, who alone could understand the voice of God. And if God did not speak to them on that day, whatever they said became the uh, devadnya, was, uh, I mean, voice of the God. Our Puroists are like them. They are like a middle-ish between man and God. But that's, that's a social feature. And it's not to do with either the language that the Egyptians spoke, the language that the Sanskrit language, or any such language. 
but it's a fact that texts like Manusmruti, for instance, exist in, uh, exist in uh, Sanskrit. Uh, say Hindi, uh, somebody like Lohia is in Hindi, uh, somebody unlike Lohia writes in Hindi. In uh, Kannada, somebody like Kuempu, I mean, very enlightened writer, or Basveshwar writes in Kannada. But somebody else, uh, I don't want to take names, uh, writes in Kannada, damning, uh, you know, women, uh, etc., etc. In Marathi, uh, Sane Guruji, Til Agarkar and Tilak wrote in Marathi, Savarkar wrote in Marathi. Uh, they have not gifts of the language. Thank you. Um, can I take the liberty of skipping a question? Or are you very close to Lang Language is the most democratic. It is accessible to everybody. We don't have to pay for it so far. Soon we'll have to pay for speaking. But so far nobody's, you know, anybody can use language. Mm -hmm. That's why it's the, you know, it's the most democratic, most civilizational. I, I think uh, uh, what do you say? Can we take a few more questions? Do we have time? Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is take Professor Vasuki's question first because he raised his hand first and then yours, sir. And. And then one more. Uh, anyway, let, let's start with. I'm, I'm not promised you or you. Professor uh, Vasuki. So, uh, sir, uh, talking about the dominance of a language or the disappearance of a language over a period of time, and we also spoke about 1947 to now, do you think the state has a role in imposition of a language on certain states as is being discussed of late? The state is given the role of protecting language. The constitution is very clear. The constitution says if, if the, for, for uh, some reason the political class has forgotten to mention a certain language as the language of the state, the governor can actually so uh, uh, say Jharkhand had nearly 14 official languages. I mean say, some were semi-official, some were official but they were, uh, that is order, first order, second order, Rajya Bhashas, they were there. But I do not think that the state, I do not think that any state can make a language or take a language. Actually, when uh, states repress languages, they spring up. And we, uh, I mentioned the Irish example. Irish was made impossible by the British authority, but uh, Celtic or Irish, they, I mean, they got the Nobel Prize in poetry, Shima Shini, one James Joyce. No, but he wrote in English, sorry. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, the, no, repression or encouragement by state uh, does not either attract a language or finish a language. The state sometimes strikes a posture showing that it cares for language because they think that it pleases the people who speak it and it benefits the state. But language is an absolutely entirely democratic uh, system. It is people's, it will remain people's and people make language I mean, simple, say, potters, cobblers, uh, tinkers, they make language, great language. Uh, they bring in new words. Uh, also, uh, the young people forming little gangs or groups, they bring new words and th that makes language colorful. E every few years, new words are brought in by young people. So, uh, language, uh, language is a peep. So far, 
लैंग्वेज इज द ओनली सिविलाइजेशन दैट पीपल हैव कंट्रोल ओवर एवरीथिंग एल्स हैज बीन टेकन अवे बाय द स्टेट बाय द पोप आई मीन बाय द बाय द चर्च और द मंदिर ऑफ वॉट यूर सो गॉड किंग बैंक्स इंश्योरेंस कंपनीज दे आर टेकन अवे एवरीथिंग पीपल हैव कंट्रोल ओवर लैंग्वेज and uh, i think we should we should keep that control and therefore people must speak when it it is necessary to speak i will notice also one phenomenon uh, today i received a call from a kolkata newspaper uh, they asked me to write on what's happening to language in the days of uh, construction of a temple it's very interesting but <clears throat> one phenomenon you have to notice powers and financial influencers in any society are noticed alienated from language the ability to speak or speak properly or speak the words they should speak goes on diminishing people language is the language makes us human different species from all other animals and i think uh, if the day we lose language we stop to be homo sapiens and we'll become homo deus or whatever cyborgs or whatever another animal another species uh, uh, professor devi you made a wonderful distinction between what is a schedule and what is an article something that gets resolved is an article something that yet to get resolved is a schedule it's a wonderful uh, distinction coming to that i think that's perhaps that's the reason why uh, we would we were able to during the constitution debate we were able to avert another partition on account of language that's that was the reason that we were able to do that the my only concern is that uh, how is this seamless intervention of the article goes into the schedule and then you still go back to the article to resolve the schedule thank you i think ambivalence is create poetry <coughs> metaphors do occasionally the schedule eight schedule also has a little footnote he says there is a language council of india the language council is headed by the home ministry that is home minister that, that is the minister in charge of the police yes yeah in india language is controlled by the police department i mean that's constitutionally so i mean but the constitution is so beautiful it also allows the education ministry to do something and so it it, it comes in Uh, uh when you know you have to uh, think of the primary education language comes in so by i mean by this uh, kind of this method allows one ministry to curb the aspirations of another ministry it the other one had not been their education ministry would have educated everybody in the same language and uh, perhaps home ministry would have divided the country in more states or whatever making uh, you know abrogation of article so and so making a state into union territories so and so so there is another and uh, that is given by the court supreme court has ruled that it is for the parents to decide what is the mother tongue of the child and not the school to decide so that is some caveat provided as far as the articles are concerned articles related to language uh, there is uh, fortunately no article saying that we have a national language of the nation national language rashtra bhasha or raj we have rajya bhasha and the republic is such that whatever the central government decides i mean the central government has decided to postpone the question between english and hindi every 10 years or 15 first for 10 years then for 15 years then for another 20 years or whatever go on it also gives power to the states to decide which are their languages 
so uh, not ruling is the best way to rule and in the case of language our constitution and our rulers have been extremely wise by but some foolish ruler does come up and say hey uh, after all aapko aise hi bolna hoga and then suddenly people get up and say hey aap kaun aane aap kaun bolne wale ho and then that this happens once in a while every 5 or 10 years this happens so we are habitual language quarrels in this country i think ambivalences uncertainties william Ke- uh, no john keats praise william shakespeare once and it's a very strange kind of praise uh, please give me half a second i mean so many people had praised shakespeare before keats but keats said the greatest quality of shakespeare is that he has a thing called negative capability and then he explains this negative capability is the ability to remain amidst uncertainties and yet not be destroyed so india remains alive amidst linguistic uncertainty and yet is not linguistically destroyed so in that sense this negative capability of indians uh, our language structures also allow that because our language structure i mean we are not language zones clearly some kind of language area as linguists will say and uh, that allows us that flexibility language migration in every family wife is speaking one language husband speak another mother speaks third one father speaks a fourth one and something like that so that's uh, that i think that's great we are indians because we are multilingual because we assimilated languages historically and because we don't give up our languages even when we speak them extremely badly <laughs> most telugu speakers today who claim telugu as their mother tongue cannot write telugu in telugu <laughs> yeah the survey shows that they cannot write about 34% telugu speakers will not be able to write a telugu letter but they are telugu speakers that's india that's india fortunately most children who claim to have studied in english medium schools cannot write english that's again india <laughs> the the last one was opening some wounds but i won't go into that <laughs> yeah no, the gentleman there and then i'll come to her uh sir it was a very wonderful discussion uh but what exactly uh, your idea of making the india without the language or beyond the language because i think language has always been patronized as the ideological state operators uh, from a larger perspective so can we think that uh, because language is only the means of communication what i think so and in that case i think english language has the more uh, uh, capability to be the emancipation and also in that case how can we think beyond uh, language yeah okay if you go to argentina and ask them what made argentina argentina uh, and uh, they will not say it's is the this language which made us who we are uh, go to nigeria and similarly you will get but in india languages coming in languages impacting language mix shaped our society and our ideas our philosophies and our attitudes to life and most most importantly attitudes to our neighbors uh, it, therefore we as Indi- who who is an indian is a question so who is an australian is a question those who belong to australian continent are Austri- Aust- australians but in india that question cannot be answered those who belong to this map are indians that's not a good answer because the map keeps changing and it may change in future also so indians are people who have 
this immense language tolerance, immense ability to absorb languages and own them up and also ability to to remain completely comfortable even when they don't know those languages well. Indians are people who are happy carrying the dialect in one pocket and standard language in another pocket. Indians are people who will not get shocked when they ride a public transport bus and hear 10 different languages being spoken by others. Whereas in Britain, not now, but at one, there was a time when you spoke either Telugu or Marathi in the public, you know, bus or train. Uh, I mean, every English person used to look at you with, you know, as some kind of disaster has happened. So our ease with language, our ease with so many presence of so many languages is what makes us Indians. This is a simple truth. Like uh, Darwin, there was a man called Darwin. Uh, there used to be a man called Darwin. Now, not known in India, but at one time he was known in India. Who said that we develop from you know apes to uh, humans, like in the process of evolution. There was a fellow called uh, Newton who said there is gravitational attraction and etc. Simple truths, but they are to be named. So this is a simple truth about India, which I am trying to name. Thank you. Uh, that will that will save us the compulsion of every time when who is Indian go back to an Upanishad. That compulsion can be removed, and then we can go back to Buddha, Mahavir. We can go to our tribes, indigenous people, coastal people, Himalayan people, uh, southern people, and so on. So the the idea of India gets expanded. Then otherwise it shrinks. It gets to seven century Brahad Aranyak Upanishad. And that should not happen. Brahadaranek Upanishad is a great thing. But there are other great things like the south of India, like the coast of India, like the indigenous of India, like the multilingual India. Thank you. Yes. Sir, uh, what is your idea of purity of language and uh, how do you differentiate uh, influence of a language on the other and language mix and probably shed some light on the power dynamic behind it? There is a theory in cognitive sciences that <clears throat> when you utter a word for the second time, it does not mean the same as it had meant the last time, previous time. It's like flowing waters. When you you dip a finger or uh, you, you know, feet, in, it's not the same water. No? It's, the river has changed. Language is an ever-flowing phenomenon. It's, uh, the, it, it, it is a miracle that out of absolute nothing it's you know when i said these words the sounds have disappeared in thin air but meaning has come to you it's a miracle of you know human intelligence that humans created this kind of language is ever flowing the meaning of any word any sentence changes every time the same word same sentence is used I mean, even if you were to sing the national anthem now and tomorrow, the meaning will be, to you, significance will be deep. It's not like the traffic signals. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, there is no constant in a language. And when there is no constant, the question of purity doesn't exist. This, but Panini had a better answer and perhaps everybody will like it. Panini raised this question, what about the purity of language? He, he, he presents it through a conversation of two. So the question is, what is Upadishta, the pure language? So he said, the answer is, the Upadishta is what the Shishtas say. Shishtas are the the, the best people in the society speak pure language. Then the next question is, and who are the Shishtas? The answer is those who speak Upadishta. <laughs> Panini was showing the circuity of, you know, this uh, circularness of this. So the, the pure is, a, uh, is, a, is uh, an act of self-satisfaction. On the day of the 12th standard examination results come out, for the parents who think that they have spent enough money on the upbringing of the child. That's all. Uh, 
thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, talk and uh, question answer session. And I now request uh, Professor Aladi Uma, chairperson of the Aladi Memorial Trust, to present mementos and propose a vote of thanks. Um, how can you thank somebody uh, who has spoken his heart? He has spoken from the heart, and so it's very difficult to thank that person adequately. But I must say that it was very kind of him to have come here, in spite of the fact that he is so much wanted all over the world and yet he ta found time for us. And I really thank you, Professor Devi, for coming and speaking to us. Professor Sharma called it a thought-provoking lecture. I think it was much more than just thought-provoking. I think it has, it has reminded us once again about the complexity of language and the power of language. And at the same time, he has taught us how to be compassionate about people through language. Power, power, can, power can corrupt, as they say, but power of language should not corrupt us, ought not to corrupt us. And thank you so much. I go back with a lot of thought. And at this time, I must also thank Professor Jyotirmay Sharma, who I approached to hold this lecture, as we have always done in collaboration with the Center for Human Rights and therefore the School of Social Sciences. Thank you very much. Um, he stole something from us today, but that was not language, okay? Uh, he stole from us the privilege of introducing him. Um, I will not let it go. The last word has to be a woman's. And therefore, um, let me take this opportunity. I can't, I can't introduce him now because he has introduced himself to the audience. But a man of such outstanding academic record who travels all over the world, who is wanted for his academic expertise is such a wonderful organizer too. So thank you, Professor Jyotir Sharma, for all that. He has introduced the School of Social Sciences. And I'm sure that many of you in the audience know the School of Social Sciences. But I must take just a few minutes uh, to talk about the Alladi Memorial Trust, which I'm sure 90% of the audience here does not know. Um, and it is here that I would like to thank, um, sometimes one thanks one's father, it might sound odd, but I do thank my father, the late Aladi Kupu Swami, who in 1983, in the centenary year of Aladi Krishna Swami, decided to have the Aladi Memorial Trust and have a lecture in memory of him in terms of the constitution and what it means to the people of India. It is in this context that every year we've been having this lecture. And for the first 20 years or so, we had the lecture uh, in the city. At which point, uh, my late father said, the audience that I see in front of me is 60 plus. And uh, what am I doing with this audience? They're not going to change. We got to take it to younger people. And I'm so thrilled, I'm really thrilled to see such young people all around me today. <clears throat> so we approached uh, Professor Hargopal here, who was then with the Center for Human Rights, 
And we said, can we have, it was not a written MOU, it was an informal MOU, and we said, shall we go ahead? And at that time, uh, the secretary of the trust, uh, Mr. Vijay Nandan, who's a lawyer, was with us then. Uh, he was with my father as secretary. So I, we approached him and he said, why not? Why not we go ahead with this? So, you know, starting from Professor Sudarshan to Professor Chandrasekhar Rao to Professor Ramavat, everybody has been very kind and very cooperative with us. And uh, last year it was Dr. Sudhakar Reddy who was also helped us to organize this lecture. So one of the aims is to bring this lecture to the younger audience and I'm so happy and I do hope we have continued support in years to come. Um, you were talking about many languages. I just mentioned a small personal incident. I never knew my grandfather, but this is all hearsay. That when Pandit Nehru came to invite him um, to be on the Constituent Assembly uh, com Committee, um, he found people in the house, as you said, speaking different languages, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, English, Hindi, and so on. And he said, I've found the right man uh, to be on my committee. And that, that speaks of one of the reasons that you have also talked about as one of the important things that is talked about in the Constitution, maybe not as much as it should be, but that's also something that must be talked about in the Constitution. And um, today we attribute the Constitution. I remember a time when I was growing up when um, Dr. Ambedkar was not given his due for the Constitution that he wrote, uh, that he and the others wrote. Um, so it is not just one person, but there were members, not just the immediate assembly, but there was a huge number of people, many women, many Dalits, many people who, common people who contributed to the Constitution. And this is what my father used to constantly tell us to remember. And therefore, I thank you very much when you asked we, the people, to sit here with us here as we uh, honored a man who respected that kind of an honor. And I do wish that we didn't have an audience there and people sitting here and all of us were sitting in a circle and talking about and discussing things. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm sorry I took a few minutes to tell you about this. We have had um, the first, first speaker. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't attend that because I was not in India at that time. Was the first person who spoke, gave the Alladi Memorial Lecture, was uh, Justice Hidayatullah, who was then the Vice President of India. But he gave the lecture not because he was the Vice President of India, but my father invited him because he was one of the few people at that time who knew my grandfather personally. And he was a person uh, who, who knew the Constitution very well. And after that, we've had judges, we have academicians, we have political, political scientists, we have had um, uh, activists, we have had people from all kinds of background who have given this lecture. So I think this has been one of my uh, most happy occasions to have had you, Professor uh, Devi, with us, because I, I have read you. I have, you may not remember me, but we have interacted in many occasions. And um, it's been a wonderful pleasure um, trying to make something so complex, so simple. Um, so um, I, I, I remember. Uh, one of my friends uh, was a co-PhD students would say things that I wouldn't understand. And then I would be very upset and go to my supervisor. And I used to tell him, because we were both students of this man, why don't I understand him? He said that because most people feel that complexity, incomprehensibility is uh, really intellectual, you know. But what is most important is what he has done for us today to make the most complex the easiest to follow. Thank you very much. May, and I, may I say that this is also the happiest moment of my life. And I'll tell you the reason. And I mean it. I started <coughs> teaching at the age of 20 in a school. Then went from school, college, university, and 
various places. Uh, in my the seventh decade of my life, 50 years of teaching, if I can think of the most brilliant student I ever had, and if I think of having that student to chair my lecture, won't I be the happiest? <laughs> so here is this brilliant man. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for giving us that As opportunity. As a student, he knew Sanskrit, Gujarati. Then he then learned Marathi, Hindi, and he uh, and many more languages. And in a way, it is because of such students that I learned to respect language. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And most important of all, I cannot but thank my audience and. Pardon me, the older lot, but thank my younger audience, okay? Uh, and uh, not that I don't thank the older ones, but I thank my younger ones. And that is what this keeps this country going. It's the young who have to take us along. It's the young who have to voice. As he said, don't lose your voice. Don't lose your speech. Don't be silent. Silent is not always eloquent, okay? Silence can be eloquent. But silence is not always eloquent. And I thank the university authorities for allowing us to have this lecture. I, thought, I thank the CV Raman Auditorium for giving us the opportunity to conduct in this, uh, in this beautiful place. I thank the student volunteers who have volunteered to help us all. I thank the technical staff here. I thank Jyotirmay Sharma's uh, office staff, sorry, Professor Jyotirmay Sharma's office staff for, for helping with all the arrangements, the wonderful tea provided by Mr. Das. And I thank everybody and everything. Thank you. If I missed out to anybody, uh, please excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, give a standing ovation to both the trust and the speaker.